So I'm going to talk about the history of karate. Um, this is going to be a very brief uh, glancing history, a real uh, survey. Uh, Reiner's going to jump in and correct me if I get something wrong, especially dates and things. Um, and we'll talk about this, this art, which is pretty much permeated um, our society, that you can go almost to any city in the United States and go to some sort of downtown or strip mall area, and you will find some sort of uh, karate school or offshoot of a karate school or an offshoot art of some kind. Uh, you can go to any college campus almost probably in the world and find a karate club. We have one here. Um, they no longer practice on campus because it is really bureaucratic to get stuff, clubs and things happening. So now they practice at the karate dojo up on Flynn Road. Anybody here in the karate club here on campus? So I, I don't know how their admissions are doing. But anyway, they are, we do have one um, and they're very good. And I recommend, if you're interested in karate, to go practice with them. Um, there are lots of offshoots of karate. You will see, uh, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about those. The one I'm not going to talk about is I'm not going to talk about Taekwondo. I'm not going to talk about um, indigenous Korean martial arts versus Korean martial arts that were heavily influenced by Japan and also by China. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, that's just because for two reasons. One is I don't have time, and the other thing is I don't know a lot about it. So maybe sometime when we do the class, we'll bring in a Taekwondo Korean person and have them talk. We've had them in before, and um, you know some Taekwondo people, and I don't know. Anyway, but not this semester. So uh, so we, we you all know what karate is. You've all seen it. It's in every movie. Uh, there's the famous uh, James Brown song. I think it's the payback. You guys heard that song by James Brown? You know, it says I don't know, I don't know karate, but I know crazy, right? That's you know. So I mean, it's in pop culture. It's 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 a great song, by the way. I should have brought a clip of that. Um, you can find it probably online. Probably you can find it online. It's a very good, very clip online. Uh, so uh, we all kind of know what karate is, but probably few of us know where it comes from and how it got to, uh, well, how it got here uh, and the route that it took to get to sort of our consciousness. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and um, give you sort of a little bit of an overview. So uh, karate comes from a place called Okinawa. It does not come from Japan originally. Okinawa, also known as the Ryukyu Islands. Uh, and I love maps. Reiner has instilled in me a love of maps, so I like to include maps. So here is Japan, island of Hokkaido, the main islands here. Here is Korea. Here is China. And here is Taiwan, the island off China. And here between Taiwan and Japan and China are a string of little islands. And there's a whole bunch of them, hundreds, hundreds of them. Uh, some are very tiny. Uh, and then there's some main ones, the main Okinawan Islands here, and this thing. This is where this art of ka karate comes from. Actually, karate doesn't even come from the whole island. It comes from these three cities down here in the south part of the island. Tomari, Naha, and Shuri. Okay. But this part's here. Now, why would a martial art develop here in between China and Japan? What do you think is the influence there? Then again, this island is small, by the way. Okinawa is a large island. It's about six miles wide. So if you're thinking like, you know, Hawaiian Islands or something, this is a tiny island. Okay, six miles wide, about 70 miles long. It's very long and skinny. Mm -hmm. About 500 miles off the coast of China, about 400 miles south of mainland Japan, and about 500 miles north of Taiwan. So it's right sort of in the middle of all these places here. Okay. You might want to also point out that's the last major battle in the world. Very good question. Yeah, a very good uh, comment. Yes, this is the last, uh, was the last battle of World War II, and a very interesting battle because the Japanese had instilled in the population, the Japanese had, was running Okinawa by World War II, uh, and instilled in the population this idea that when Americans came, they were going to basically kill all the women and children, rape the women, rape the children, you know, all these horrible things. And so as American soldiers fought into Okinawa, and it was a very, very vicious fight, uh, 
Japanese citizens were throwing themselves off cliffs with their children in their hand. A very interesting um, history. It was a very tough battle, in other way. And then why are we going to Okinawa here? Of course, this is this whole thing about World War II of island hopping, where we went from one island and we skipped one and went to another one. The idea is to get close enough to the mainland, and when you get close enough to the mainland, you can start sending bombing raids over much more easily, and this was in preparation for invading uh, the mainland, which of course never happened, as you know, because we didn't have to do that, because instead we dropped uh, two atomic bombs on Japan. Okay. And uh, you can debate whether that was a good thing to do or a bad thing to do, and the debate still uh, rages on, because if we had had to fight into mainland Japan, um, the fighting would have been incredibly difficult, and we probably would have lost, the estimate's about 500,000 men uh, and the Okinawa, the Battle of Okinawa sort of pointed out how fanatically the Japanese were going to resist. And so possibly that could have had some influence on, you know, decision to drop the bombs, I don't know or not. Um, that's modern Japanese history. We're not going to really talk that much about modern Japanese history today. We have a class on modern Japan, right? Professor Noldi teaches it or Professor uh, Corbett teaches it? Yeah. One or the other, yeah. So we have a very good class on modern Japan. Um, and if you take our Nazi Germany class next semester, shameless plug, I will mention briefly the uh, medical atrocities uh, perpetrated by the Japanese against the Chinese and Koreans and Russians uh, a little bit uh, in that class, but not a whole lot. Okay. But we really ought to, at some point, have a class on the Pacific War. Um, but this thought he's talking about. All right, so anyway, we're not going to talk about that now. Uh, we're going to go back to this little island here in between things. It is historically important. It's equidistant from these things. So if you are doing a trading trip from China to Japan, you might be tempted just to go straight from here, straight to Japan. But as I think believe Reiner told you uh, last lecture, this uh, East China Sea here is very rough. And so, you know, this is, you know, it's actually difficult to sail from China straight to Japan. It's doable, but it's really rough. Easier to do is to go from China and to hug along these islands. And if things get bad, you can always put into an island. You can shelter your ship. You know, you can stop off for supplies. And so Okinawa being right in the middle is this place where trade is coming both ways. Trade also comes from the Philippines. So there's also, there's also influence from the Philippines. And so you have influence from China. You have influence from Japan. You have influence from other places in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and so this, this makes it a very historically important sort of stop along the way uh, uh, for, for uh, sort of Asian trade, uh, maritime trade here. There's another map. Here again is Okinawa here, kind of not in, not in scale because it would be much smaller than this. And you can see here uh, the other places. This is Southeast Asia here. Uh, Philippines is relatively close to as well, okay. um, almost the same distance from the Philippines to, to Tokyo, at least by this map. So again, this becomes an important trading place. So um, the martial art that we know as karate was originally developed by the inhabitants of Okinawa as an empty fighting hand system, which they called tei. Tei means in the Okinawan language, means hand. And the empty hand really comes about um, later on uh, when Okinawa is sort of controlled by other powers, most specifically later on uh, the Japanese, when they ban uh, the use of weapons. And so um, uh, this, is, this is sort of imposed on the Okinawans. And so this, this encourages the development of empty hand fighting techniques and uh, later on, what they do is they develop weapons that are hidden. They use basically common farm implements, uh, get turned into weapons. And so you're carrying around, you know, a butter churn handle. You know, nobody can say, you can say, hey, that's a weapon. No, no, this is from just churning butter with this thing. Or I'm carrying around a horse bridle. That's just a horse bridle. It's not a weapon, right? It doesn't look like a weapon, as opposed to a sword or something like this. Um, and so basically, you have a system that develops around empty hands and, um, and then basically hidden, hidden weapons. Mm -hmm. And here's a picture. This is an old Okinawan picture here. This is how they would practice back in the day. Notice they're not wearing geese, you know, the traditional outfit um, that we see now that we associate with karate. They're wearing pants, no shirts. Their belts are basically there to hold their pants up. They're all brown belts, right? Because these are just belts to hold their pants up. 
Okay, but this is traditionally how a little bit more traditionally how they would have practiced. Uh, it was this art was kept secret until the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, and again, part of the reason was that, and I can talk to you about some of the some of the theories about why this was so. But one of was that by this time, uh, Okinawa is controlled by Japan. It was controlled by a specific uh, family that were basically the governors of the South uh, Japanese Islands, and then they were given the idea of you know their role was to. Uh, you know, basically oversee Okinawa, and so they banned all these different weapons. They also um, uh, would hold possibly, you know, some of the royal family of Okinawa kind of like hostage. You know, they take like, you know, okay, your, your daughter's going to go live in Japan now, and the unknown thing is that, or the unsaid thing is that, you know, if you screw up, you know, her life is forfeit. And so there's that kind of thing going on, and there also was pressure put on uh, Okinawans later on by none other than Admiral Perry and the Americans who also wanted to open up this place for trade and the Jap Japanese didn't like that uh, as well. Okay. So karate, uh, because of Okinawa's place in, in a geographical location, uh, karate was influenced by a number of different martial arts that came through Okinawa. And again, you have China, you have Japan, you have uh, the Philippines, uh, Southeast Asia, and what, who come to these, you know, you're coming in uh, on trading expeditions, you're coming in on a boat, who gets off the boat, you know, when they, when they land? Sailors get off the boat. And what do sailors do? Drink. They drink, they go to bars, they drink, they hang out. What happens at bars? People get in fights, and the sailors might break out a certain kind of martial art, a fight might happen, somebody go, hey man, that's pretty cool. And later on, next morning, when they wake up, say, hey, you know, that was pretty cool. Hey, would you like to show me something? You know, like, we'll trade some martial arts stuff. And so martial arts influences come from all these places in Asia. Um, and the main, the main influence, of course, is going to be China. Because China is, you know, where a lot of uh, martial arts are developed. And as you know, um, of course, uh, the southern Chinese um, developed uh, Shaolin, Shaolin martial arts or southern Sha Chinese Sha Shaolin temples and there are Okinawans also who traveled to China so you have to think back in the day it would be equivalent if you lived um, let's say you lived you know someplace pretty remote you lived you know maybe uh, I'm just trying to think of a good example right now you lived uh, um, maybe in Hawaii and you know you were you had a culture there and things were going pretty good, but you really wanted to go you know new you know you graduated high school you want to go to college and you want to go off to the big city. So what you do is you come to uh, you come to California and you go to school in Los Angeles. You go to UCLA because that's the big city, and, you, and then, then you go learn at UCLA, you get your degree, and then you go back home to Hawaii and bring whatever you, skills you have back to your island home. It's similar to that. So the idea is, is in, in, for the Okinawans, China was high culture. China was sort of the seat of civilization. China was where all the civilized stuff is coming from. And so the idea that if you're in Okinawa, you would go to China, you know, makes a lot of sense. So what do you get from what do you get from China? You get from you get all sorts of things. You get food. You get uh, uh, later on tea. You get religion, philosophy. You get martial arts. All these things get imported to Okinawa, and of course they also get imported to Japan uh, later on. Um, and so, you know, the idea that Okinawans would go to China to learn something makes a lot of sense. And there are, there are certain Okinawans who went to China specifically to learn martial arts. And where do they go in China? They, they go to the Southern Shaolin temples. Okay. Now, uh, what else do I want to say about that? Um, so you have influence from uh, China, uh, Southern Shaolin temples, and you also have the influence of a specific style that derives from Southern Shaolin martial arts. And this is the Southern White Crane style. Southern White Crane style. This is, this is a style that has a heavy, heavy influence on karate. And if you look at karate and you look at Southern White Crane, you will see many, many similarities. And in fact, there are even some schools of karate 
that are that still are very very close to the original Chinese martial art, and they can actually do the forms or the kata, and they can look and say, oh yeah, that's just like what we do. And you know, they still they're still very very similar. We, and they even traveled to each other. There's a group here from uh, America uh, that that traveled uh, with their Japanese teacher to southern China, and to compare with the white crane people what they were doing, and they found they were very very still very similar. Um, so this is really important. So a lot of influence, a lot of influence from sailors coming in, a lot of influence from China, some influence from the Philippines, and later on, some influence from Japan. Now, one theory about the development of, the, of karate as a martial art was that its primary use was to protect the Okinawan royal family. So the Okinawan royal family, they live in the town called Shuri. And this, this, this idea is promoted in this book here uh, by the Sky Clayton. Um, and the, the royal family is in the town of Shuri, and the idea is that karate techniques basically focus, in his view, focus on fighting in enclosed spaces like inside the royal palace. It also assumes that the opponents would have weapons and that the uh, karate people would not, and the karate people as trained palace guards would only get a chance to, 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 to basically hit one time before they would be shot or you know, hacked with a sword or something. And so this whole idea in karate, one of the one of the principles is one punch, one kill, one hit, one kill. And and Clayton believes that this is because they were going to fight guys basically with guns and maybe with swords, and that you're only going to get one hit. And so you have to really uh, develop your striking ability such that you can really make that one hit count. Okay? Because and the other thing is he claims that there are other techniques in, in karate that basically have to do with grappling in enclosed spaces and of taking a royal family member, heaving him across your shoulders and running upstairs and getting away from the enemy. And so he talks about some of the kata and some of the movements and the techniques in karate and says he can see these, uh, these things in here. This interpretation is controversial. A lot of karate people don't really like this. They think this is kind of maybe a little far-fetched, uh, but it does make some sense in that the royal family of Okinawa is, uh, in, for a lot of Okinawan history, really between a rock and a hard place. Um, and at times, Okinawa is giving tribute to China. Other times, Okinawa is giving to, uh, tribute to Japan. And I believe there was a time when Okinawa was giving tribute to both China and Japan. And when the Japanese come, uh, you know, they institute this ban on weapons. There's a lot of pressure on the royal family to, uh, to do what the Japanese want. Um, and then, of course, when Admiral Perry comes and they sort of force the country open, they take a little trip down to Okinawa and they go to Okinawa and they say, we want you to open up, you know, uh, you know the island to trade. Uh, but the Okinawans are under strict orders by the Japanese not to do that. So they're between a rock and a hard place. Admiral Perry has guns. The Japanese sort of have control over them and they have hostages back in Japan from the royal family. So what do they do? They're really in a rock and a hard place. So they have to sort of... Um, uh, him and ha and try to negotiate and stall for time and it's very uncomfortable for them and so the royal family um, is really you know sort of under a lot of pressure and okay, put it mildly mm -hmm. now there's some ideas too that they may have had um, scenarios for you know if the Japanese uh, try to do something or Admiral Perry tried to do something and including maybe having hidden cases of weapons and things like this and this idea that karate was one of those things, one of those secret things that they had that they could use if things got really bad, um, you know, is in some ways makes sense. You know, the so the ideas in this book make sense, but you know, again, not everybody's buying this. You know? This is the Shuri Castle. This is the home of the Okinawan royal family. You can go there. It's this was destroyed in World War II. Uh, but it's been rebuilt, and so you can go there, and it's very nice. It is one of my intentions at some point to do one of these international trips and go to Okinawa and look at all these karate places and then go to southern China and look at the southern Chinese martial arts. That would be a really fun trip to do. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get to do it, because again, we have so much bureaucracy here, it's very difficult, but this would be a great place to go visit. So it's on my list of places to visit. And you can wander around in there and see, does it make sense that karate techniques would be you know, developed for fighting inside this building. Mm -hmm. 
So um, later on, uh, the pressures on Okinawans uh, really come more from the Japanese and specifically from the samurai who administer Okinawa. And uh, they sometimes encourage foreign trade and other times they frown upon it and they mete out heavy punishments to uh, the, the, the Okinawans for violating any sort of violations. And again, the rules of Okinawa are sort of between a rock and a hard place. And I think it's, Reiner, correct me, the family that was in charge of the of Okinawa, the Satsuma, it's the Satsuma family? I think it's Satsuma, but I need to be wrong about that. Um, and so this goes on, we can say this goes on basically through the 1800s. By the 1900s, you know, Japan has modernized, uh, you know, tremendously. Okinawans are really now sort of culturally more part of Japan. And in fact, they speak Japanese. Um, you know, they, and so things like karate can now sort of come out uh, from under uh, secrecy. And so it starts to be practiced a little bit more, um, a little bit more openly, and it comes to the attention of the mainland Japanese. And they see this art, they go, hey, that's really cool, and you guys now are pretty much Japanese. I'm kind of paraphrasing here, you're pretty much Japanese. This is a pretty cool thing. And so a number of uh, Okinawan karate masters go to Japan and demonstrate uh, this art. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that happens is one of them, uh, who I'll talk about a little bit later, actually is, uh, gets to demonstrate uh, karate in front of the emperor. And the emperor is impressed and has favorable comments about this. And then after that, lots of people in Japan become interested in karate. And then karate teachers uh, move from Okinawa, they migrate from Okinawa to Japan, to places like Tokyo, they open up schools, and they start teaching uh, karate. Okay. And you can even see this picture, it's kind of a weird picture, because this is people openly practicing karate in front of the Okinawa, or in front of the Okinawan uh, royal family uh, palace. Okay. And you see they're all just in pants and shirts and everything, but notice this one guy here is wearing an actually traditional karate gi. So this is a picture that had to be taken after Okinawan Karate goes to Japan, becomes established in Japan, and then comes back to Okinawa. Because the Okinawans didn't wear karate geese. Where did, this, where did this outfit, you guys know what I mean by gi, you know, the white you know, thing and the pants and the belt, you know, and the belts are ranked. This outfit, the karate gi, comes from judo. It's not come from karate, the judo guys had this. And in fact, what happens is Okin Karate goes to Japan and it becomes noticed. And one of the most famous judo guys, a guy named Kano, who runs the famous Kodokan uh, judo uh, school in Tokyo, I believe it's in Tokyo, he uh, looks at karate and he goes, this is really cool. And he really likes it. And so what he does is he invites, he invites uh, karate guys to the Kodokan and asked them to teach his judo students, uh, you know, a few basic karate things. And in turn, he also teaches the karate guys some basic judo things. And so there becomes this sort of friendly interchange between karate and judo. And one of the things the karate people adapt is the gi, the judo gi, and the belt system. Okay. So those things are actually very Japanese. Okay. They're not. They're not Okinawan. Yeah, I remember this. So here's another, I talked about Commodore Perry and the American warships. Um, again, here's a painting of the Americans coming into Okinawa and bothering the Okinawans. And of course, as you know, as Reiner told you, that the you know, Japanese and uh, the Okinawans are, are eventually the country is forced open and they are, they are required to, uh, to uh, start trading with uh, 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 the Americans. Now, there's a very good movie of this, by the way. I think it stars John Wayne as Admi Admiral Perry. It's an older movie. It's pretty interesting. It's very jingoistic. Yeah, it's really very, very, very skewed the American side of things. Uh, but it, I, I should get the name of it. It's actually it's worth a watch. It's interesting. Yeah, you can look that up. It's interesting. Yeah. And by the way, here are some Japanese uh, portraits of Perry. <laughs> so, you know, there's a ship with this, you know, kind of demonish face on it, you know, and they really thought the Americans are really big demons, right? And they did this portrait of them, and um, it's not a flattering portrait here. 
Um, and this was really a pivotal event, as Reiner told you, for this rather xenophobic country of Japan. But of course, they realized, unless they adopted Western military te technology and tactics, that they would be subject to the bullying of the Western powers. Now, how did they know this? How did they know the Western powers would, might bully them? What? It was already happening in China? It was already happening in China, and they were very well aware of what was going on in China. And the Chinese were basically, getting, China was basically being carved up. And the Japanese, um, the Chinese probably had a chance to modernize too, um, but never kind of stuck in the traditions, you know, stuck in the old ways, never, you know, and the idea that we're the center of the universe, and so never really did it. The Japanese on an island, a little bit sort of out of the mainstream, looking over there to see what's going on in China, going, yeah, that ain't good. We're not going to go down that road. And so ja Japan undergoes this incredibly quick program of modernization. So they go basically from being um, samurai warriors in the, you know, in the, you know, I don't know, Reiner, 1870, you know, I mean, with the Meiji restoration of 1868, so 1870s, to by the time they're on the turn of the century, you know, 1910 or something, 40 years later, they've gone from an army of samurai soldiers with swords to a modern army with, you know, modern military technology that's every bit as good as uh, that found in Western powers. This includes battleships and, um, you know, machine guns, cannons, you know, everything. The barbarian navigation. The barbarian navigation, yes. But yeah. he's actually the first U.S. Consul General. Oh, he's not Perry, he's a Consul General. But they kind of make him a little like Perry, you know, John Wayne. So if you want to watch that, yeah, very, very, very jingoistic, you'll get the American point of view, which unfortunately is, um, you know. Uh, so 40 years, Japan modernizes its military. Uh, and not only just the weapons and stuff, but also the tactics. And again, if you've seen the movie The Last Samurai, which is a good movie if you overlook the fact that Tom Cruise basically saves the samurai, right? That you know you had this that part is really I find incredibly offensive, and I'm not even Japanese. Um, that Tom Cruise could come in and in a short amount of time train a little bit with the sword, and now he's the sword guy, and he can go out there and defy you know. If you just take that part out of the movie, it's very well done. And the idea you see in the, in the final scenes, I don't know, are you going to show some of the clips of the final scenes? So the final scenes of the movie, you know, where, where the samurai, the traditional samurai, are going up against these now Western, uh, you know, Western trained, um, you know, Japanese soldiers with machine guns or Gatling guns, and you see what happens to them. And, and clearly, 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 um, you know, at least as far as being situated in the modern world and not getting bullied by Western powers, Japan did the right thing, right? Um, and, uh, but this also then also modernizing the military also kind of opens up Japan's ambitions. And they also realize, hey, where is, and they have a fight, they have a war with Russia early in the 1900s, and they beat the Russians. And now you have the first time an Asian power has beat a Western power uh, in a modern war. And the Japanese now sort of take their place as somebody as a as somebody to be reckoned with. Okay, and again, this also leads them to have more pressure to get more resources to keep this modern army up. And of course, that leads them to invade China and to cause all sorts of problems. And that eventually leads to them, um, the United States saying, "Hey, we don't like that. We're going to restrict, you know, what you can get." And the Japanese taking great umbrage of that, and then in a kind of harebrained scheme, thinking that if they attack Pearl Harbor, they'll knock out American. Uh, ability to sort of control Asia, and um, and then we'll just basically back out and leave them alone, which is, you know, not a smart idea. And actually, some of the Japanese uh, people in the high command knew that didn't think that that was a good idea, and warned that if you do this, you're going to wake the sleeping giant of America, and they're going to be really pissed. And of course, that's what happened. And of course, World War II, on and on and on. But before that, let's go back, back. Um, We have these Okinawa arcs. So let's go back to Okinawa. There are three cities here: Tomari, Naha, and Shuri. And these Te fighting arts, usually called Te, developed over many, many, many years. Okay. And there are stylistic differences between these uh, cities, between the arts that developed in these cities, because you're going to have different influences. For instance, if you're in Shuri, where the royal palace is. Maybe your version of martial arts, what you're developing, is going to have uh, more about protecting the royal family. Maybe if you're here in Tamari, 
you're near the coast. So you're going to get a lot more sailors coming in and bringing in stuff. And you're going to get you know, maybe more influence from people coming from other places. And if you're in Naha, maybe you're in a farming place, and maybe you know this is where you think, hey, maybe I can't have a sword, but I can take this uh, you know, horse's bridle and make it into a weapon. And so you get different, a little bit stylistic differences here. Okay? But you have to realize these places are incredibly close to one another. Remember, the island is six miles wide. So this is like, uh, this is Camrio, this is Oxnard, and you know, maybe this is Thousand Oaks, right? I mean, maybe not even that far. I mean, they're really close to one another. So again, there's some stylistic differences, but they're very close. So there's a lot of interchange between the stylists in these different cities as well, okay? Um, in general, Okinawa Te was also known as Tode which means Chinese hand. And this indicates the major influence on, on Okinawan martial arts. The major influence comes from China. There's other influences, but also, you know, obviously China is one of the major things. So originally it's called China hand, Chinese hand. Now, the three styles of Tay eventually split up into two main subgroups. This is a little complicated. Don't, you don't need to worry too much about this. Um, there is something called Shorinru that comes from Shuri and Tomari, and Shoreru, which comes from Naha. Shorinru also really gives a name. Shorin is just kind of a Japanization of Shaolin. And again, we also have Shaolin martial arts that developed in the mainland of, of Japan, separate from, separate from uh, Okinawa, called Shorinji-ru. Right, so there are a couple different schools that come to Japan in Okinawa that keep the name Shaolin, Shorinru. Right? Um, some believe that the, the difference in styles is fairly superficial, but it, that Clayton book I talked about uh, basically it argues that the Shuri style was heavily influenced by the needs of the palace stars. Other people, such as John Sells, and I'll talk to you about John Sells uh, near the end. He is a modern uh, American uh, guy who is one of the highest, maybe the highest ranked non-Japanese in karate. And uh, he wrote a book called Unate, The Secret of Karate. This is a book that basically outlines the history and development of karate that is so thoroughly researched that the Japanese refer to this book. Okay. So it's a very, very good book. Uh, it, it is the best book on karate. So if you want to get a book and understand where karate comes from, its history, how the techniques developed, John Sell's book is that is the one you want to get. And it is, it is the, it is the you know, Bible of karate, if you will, at least in my opinion. And Sells gives the opinion that Nahate style remained very close to the original Southern Shaolin White Crane Kung Fu because its originators actually went to China and studied this. And this is the style that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that style, the modern version of the style a little bit later on. Now, a guy named Jinshin Funakoshi, this is the founder of Shotokan Karate, and he is one of the guys that went to Japan and sort of brought uh, karate to Japan. Um, this style probably was mostly derived from Shurite, okay? and, he is, and this is the suggestion that the Shuri, Tomarite, and the Nahate styles had developed techniques suitable for practitioners with different physical requirements. Okay? So this is kind of like what I was talking about before. Um, that the Shurite people are fighting, also geographical requirements. Nahate people are fighting, you know, maybe near the ocean. Um, again, they're more Chinese, more circular, synchronized breath. And the Shurite, or Tamari tail cells are quick and linear, and they use natural breathing. So again, there's again, some differences. And by the way, here's a bunch of some of the early, early uh, uh, progenitors of karate, the early masters from Okinawa, and a bunch of these guys. I'm not going to go into their, into their history, but there's lots of stories about these guys. You can read them up, and they're very interesting. In Okinawa, by the way, lots of people, lots of people who did karate, studied with masters from all three cities. So there was no rule if you were Naha, you only had to practice that stuff. You might practice your Naha Te style and go over to Shuri and find a Shuri guy and, and study with him for a while. So again, there is lots of interchange. So don't want to make these things sound like they're really that, that different. There's a huge amount of interchange. Now, we can also kind of compare a little bit karate and the development of karate with what happens in China with kung fu. And we see some similar divisions 
uh, in, in northern and southern Chinese Kung Fu styles. Okay? And you can see the Shurite, Tamarite styles that are quick and linear um, look a lot like northern Kung Fu styles. And the southern Kung Fu styles are more circular, they're closer in fighting, and we see, uh, we see these in, 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 in the Nahate styles. And so in one way you can look at Okinawa as like a little small microcosm uh, martial arts of what sort of we see also in China. And it's also possible that the northern Chinese styles, which are linear and explosive and fast, such as Shaolin Long Fist uh, style Baji, which I didn't show you, and then Xingyi, which is this five element boxing style, it's possible that these could have, there could have been influence from China, these northern styles that somehow got to the Shuri style, the Shuri Tomari style, while the Naha style was more influenced by the southern Chinese. There's no proof of this, um, but this is, if you look at, if you look at the martial arts, you know, even though we don't have any historical proof connection, you look at the martial arts, you can really see a similarity. So here's a guy in China, he's doing Xing Yi style, and here's a Japanese karate guy doing karate, and you look at it and you go, wow, it's really similar. You know, this is a shurite style, really similar, really, really similar way that power is generated, really similar movements, really similar postures. And so there may be, there may be something to this. Okay? And likewise with the southern uh, Chinese. And I think I had a video here. This comes up. YouTube is Sorry. great for people that are just starting a new business. Sorry. This could be that. So this guy is uh, Higuana, is a karate guy from the Nahate style, which is now called Gojuru. I'm going to talk about this later on. And he takes his students to China. And they look to see, they're looking to see. They know that there's a history that they and Higuana is from Okinawa, and they take their they go over to they go over to China to see these white crane guys to see how they know their their, their style derived from that to see how similar they are. And this is and one of the things they find is they get to China. It's in here somewhere. They start talking to the white crane guys. I'll let you guys, you can watch this on your own. Anyway, but the idea is they find that these Chinese stylists are doing almost, it's very similar. Their style hasn't changed that much, you know, in the, you know, 200 years since, uh, you know, it came from China. And so it's very interesting. And I even know that people, they've actually gone over there and they've, they've met with them and they're exchanging ideas and exchanging techniques and things like that. So it's still going on. By the way, Higuana uh, has a student in, um, who's in Thousand Oaks Westlake, um, Mel Prego, who runs the Conejo Karate School down there, and he is a direct student of Higuana's, the Higuana family, and he's teaching down there. So if you're really interested in this style, this Nahate-derived style of karate, there's a guy in, in the county who's like really legitimate uh, in that lineage. Here's another example of the similarities, a sort of northern style. Here you go, it's your sidekick, your karate guy doing sidekick here, right? And here you have somebody doing northern Shaolin style. This is actually my teacher, Sifu Wong, um, and he is doing northern style sidekick. And look, it's almost the same, very, very similar. And so the idea that there's some connection between these styles you know, kind of makes some sense. There's another guy, another posture here, and here you see Sifu Wong, the same, almost the same kind of posture, same stances. Okay, so the idea that there's some connection between these two things, I think, is very, very interesting. If I sp spoke and wrote Chinese and Japanese, 
and could go to the archives in these places and study this, I would go study this and try to find this connection. There is some anecdotal information that you'll hear people talking about some karate masters who went and studied northern Chinese styles, but it's just anecdotal. There's no, there's no paper trail, there's no proof, there's no other people corroborating it, but there is some anecdotal uh, suggestion, at least some karate guys, probably from the Shuri, Tamari style, got influenced, were influenced by the Norman Chinese styles. Now let's talk about lineage. There's lots of lineages of different styles of K, and it's a little bit difficult to point these out. I'm just going to point these out to show you these. There's a lot of overlap between the Shuri K and the Tamari K styles, and less overlap with these two styles of the Naha Te. So one thing you can think of is that there's Naha Te derived styles kind of over here, and then there's everything else. The Shuri and the Tomari sort of mix and interact. Okay, so that's one way to look at it. So you can look at this. Here you go. And so this is a Shudokan lineage here, and you can look and see these people who's doing it. Um, you know. You have this guy, Chojin Miyagi. This is actually a guy from the Nahate style. So again, this is a style where things are a little bit mixed up here. You can see there's this style of karate, you have mixed up Nahate, Shurite, Tamarite, a little bit more mixed up. Um, Tamarite lineage, you can see here again, um, this is a little bit more, um, you can say maybe pure. Again, you can see the weapons, I'll show you some weapons later. Okinawan Shurite, again, you see these guys, and out of all these guys in the Shurite lineage, this guy here, uh, Genshin Funakoshi, is probably one of the more important ones. Because he is the developer of Shotokan, and he is one of the guys who brings, brings karate to Japan. Notice he lives until 1954, so he has a long life, and so he has a lot of influence over his life. Uh, by the way, women uh, can certainly study karate. There's no um, limitations on women studying this art. Um, and there are very, very excellent women practitioners of karate uh, still out there. This is one, uh, Nobuko Oshiro, um, who is a Shorinru, uh, seventh dawn. Dawn means black belt. And so then the levels of black belt, you get up, but by the time you get seventh dawn, you're essentially kind of a master. Uh, and so she's very, very good. And I, have, I think I have a video here, though, of some women doing some karate. <coughs> no, this is the guy. So, so again, one thing in karate that, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about this later, but one thing in karate is that a lot of, there, there's a way to practice uh, the art on your own without having a partner. And you can do something called kata, K-A-T-A. -A. And kata is a choreographed sequence of movements that, uh, that, that include uh, karate techniques. Okay, and they have te you know, the techniques are included in there. And um, you can practice this on your own. It's a way you can train your body. And theoretically, it's a way you can train your fighting ability, though I would take some umbrage with that. I don't really think the kata is much useful for fighting. Um, but it is good training for your body. And good training for your body, good training in doing the fighting moves, even if they're not gonna necessarily um, directly affect your ability to do them with other people, you, you know, doing them on your own is a good practice. So you can see this is a kata here. Let's show you a few minutes of this. And you can see the kind of explosive power that karate has. Let's give you a few seconds of that. I can show you more of this stuff later. Okay. Um, some schools practice a lot of kata. Uh, kata is pretty typical for karate schools. Some schools don't practice many. Uh, the school of karate that I practice, uh, we don't do much kata. All our, most of our kata are two-person kata. We do it with another person to make it more realistic for fighting. Um, a lot of schools, if you go to study traditional karate, you will, you will learn uh, many, many, many different kata and a lot of, most of the schools spend a lot of time practicing kata. And this is one of the things that Bruce Lee didn't like. I think you got this from Peter, that this is one of the things Bruce Lee didn't like. He thought kata were sort of a useless um, thing to be spending time if you really wanted to learn to fight, okay? I'm not as, I'm not as um, uh, biased against kata as Bruce Lee and the Jeet Kune Do school. I think kata can be very important. They're very good for training your body and for 
developing muscle memory for certain things. They will not, in and of it by themselves, teach you how to fight. You know, and there's a great line out of a famous samurai movie that says, you know, uh, swordsmanship untested in battle is like swimming on dry land. And so, you know, it's like you actually have to go out and encounter another person to really learn how to fight. You can't just do it all in the air. But doing it in the air, you do learn moves, you get muscle memory, you condition your body. Those things are really useful. Um, and so you'll find different karate schools will, will emphasize kata to different degrees. Okay? My school does not emphasize it very much. If you go to the traditional Shotokan school here in Camarillo, uh, they do a lot of kata. They're very good at it. Their kata is excellent. And you can see the, uh, you know, you can see what you're doing. You know. They also do other stuff too, but you know, kata is very common. It's just people are probably unrealistic about the benefits of kata practice for fighting. That's how I would say it. And we're talking about Japan right now, but I would tell you the Chinese are even worse about kata practice. Many Chinese schools, you only do kata practice, and they'll tell you if you just practice this kata, you're going to be, you know, you'll be able to go and beat up anybody. You know, and that's just not true. Okay? And you can always test that empirically. I have tested that empirically, and I can tell you it's not true. You know, I did kata for 30 years, and then went to a Thai boxing school, and basically got my ass handed to me. So. You know, so much for kata. They don't do much. It really, kata and Thai boxing is completely ritualistic. We're going to talk about that later. Um, they don't really do any kata, you know. And so, you know, I think this is something you can test for yourself. Okay. okay. So let's talk a little about Funakoshi, Jinjin Funakoshi, the founder of Shotokan Karate. Uh, he was born in Shuri, so it's mostly a Shuri style. Um, he was trained by a couple different masters. Um, and he also supposedly learned some Nahate style again. There was lots of cross training. But if you look at Shotokan Karate, you will see it looks very much more like Shuri, Tamarite uh, type of, um, uh, of, of style. Mm -hmm. Now, Funakoshi was one of the first Karateka. Karateka is, a, is basically is a word that means a practitioner of karate. One of the, he was the first one to introduce karate to Japan. He was invited in 1917 to perform an exhibition by the Ministry of Education and asked to come back again in 1922 to do another exhibition. And he came back a third time where he got to perform for the Emperor of Japan. And that sort of made him famous. And he decided to stay in Japan and teach karate. He had a number of students who further developed uh, his karate style. Uh, the style was called Shotokan, which is uh, Funakoshi's pen name. And Funakoshi wrote some of the first books on karate. These were also highly influential, also especially in the West. And he died in the late 50s at the age of 88. And so Shotokan is one of the more popular styles of karate. And if you go to do uh, karate in, in uh, Camarillo, and you want to find a school, the school of karate in Camarillo is Shotokan. So we have Shotokan Camarillo Karate School up on Flynn Road. You can go up there and. Uh, Sean Danaher is the sensei, and Sean is actually a graduate of our psychology program here and um, been practicing karate since he was a little kid. And so he is very, very, very good. And it's a good school. I highly recommend it if you're thinking of practicing karate and you want to stay in Camarillo. It's a great school. So um, they're just up the road, and they come from this tradition of Funakoshi. Go to the dojo, you'll see a picture of Funakoshi there. Um, there are lots of different Shotokan schools. Um, and they vary on what they, you know, how they practice, how tough they are, you know, what they emphasize, kata versus fighting, these kind of things. Um, I show you a little video of uh, Japan Defense Force. Uh, Japan's not really allowed to have an army per se, but they have a so-called defense force, and these are their military. And so these military guys uh, practice Shotokan Karate, and they are, they are really hardcore. As far as um, when they practice, they go when they practice fighting, sparring, they go full tilt. This is full contact sparring. They don't wear any protective gear. They are really tough. So I just going to show you a little video of this. I'll show you just a few minutes of this. You can see sort of hardcore karate. <laughs> which is based on Okinawan Shodin Ryu, is what most members in the Japan Self-Defense Force learn. The kata jion, as well as modifications to other kata, have all been made to accommodate competition. 
while adopting the rules of sport karate, the self-defense force karate has created its own independent style, adding more speed, which clearly simulates actual hand-to-hand -hand combat. In wall sparring, the karate student is cornered against a wall while opponents attack one after the other. Fluid awareness, quick reflexes, and speedy attack and defense are necessary for this method of training. Free sparring is based on the principle of a one-punch knockout. Students are not allowed to wear protective face gear. This helps strengthen the student's mind and body. そう、あの、力強いカラテ Karate is supposed to have one hit, one punch, knockout, right? Notice those guys are going essentially full tilt. Nobody got knocked out. The one punch, one kill is easy to say and very, very hard to do. And in practice, for practical martial arts, my opinion, you can take this with a grain of salt, my opinion is not that useful. Not that useful. Maybe if you're a Shuri uh, bodyguard and you're stuck in the Shuri temple and, you know, you got... Admiral Perry's guys with guns on you. Maybe you really got to get that one punch, one kill. But for the rest of us in the modern world, one punch, one kill is not very useful. Okay. And you saw they're sparring. They're going pretty full tilt. You saw how bloody the guy's face was. He didn't get knocked out. Right? And you guys have watched boxing, you've watched MMA. One punch knockouts. If you only got one punch to knock the guy out, how, would, how is that going to work? Is that going to work really well? No. You know, so you've got to have other stuff going on. And what you see is in modern karate that they will still talk about one punch, one kill, but they do a lot of other stuff. And in our school, we essentially don't really think much of the one punch, one kill idea. We set guys up with a lot of other techniques, a lot of other punches, throws and everything, and then we try to knock them out. We don't just try to punch one punch and knock them out. It's not realistic. Okay? And you can even see these guys when they're fighting, they're not doing that. Okay. Uh, you can see some techniques here. Show you some techniques. Again, pretty tough practice. In many karate competitions, the All Japan Self Defense Force Tournament is the most brutal. Self Defense Force instructor Yoshitama Muneo, who has won several trophies at these competitions, will demonstrate some of his technical marvels. <laughs>
精神的な面でですね、えー、やはり自衛隊というのは有事を想定して、えー、いろんな演習をしたり、えー、いろんな訓練をやりますで有事というのはやっぱり最悪の場合ですから生きるか死ぬかという状況に追い込まれるそういうのを設定しなくちゃいけないわけですよねですからそれを空手道に生かした場合、えー、素手で殴って殴られる足が折れる人体が切れるでそれでもう痛いからやらないそれでやっぱり自衛隊の空手じゃないと思います自衛隊とか警察そういったの公的機関のしかも国民を守る立場にいる我々はやはり国民から信頼されることが一番だと思うんですねそれと安心されることやはりそれを公然とですね空手の試合で自衛隊は強い警察は強いとかそういうことを国民の人が知ってもらうことは一つの安心感を与えることだと思うんですだから私はまあそれ目的はそれだけではありませんがそれも一つの目的には入りますその競技の中でこれはスポーツだからとか武道だからとかそういう考え方よりもやはり強い人っていうのはそのルールで勝てると思うんですよねそのあらゆるルールでそのルールの戦い方を覚えることによってちょっと難しいかもしれませんけど私はそう思ってるんですとはいえ競技のことをわからないと試合にもなりませんので競技は競技の練習をする。I like these guys. This is this is the real deal stuff. This is the real deal. You don't see these guys fighting in MMA matches, right? Also, they're not showing you here all the things that are completely illegal. That might be actually be illegal in MMA. I, MMA, I don't know. They're not showing you all the stuff that's completely illegal in MMA. So you realize MMA is a sport, even though it's pretty violent and those guys are pretty good. There are rules, right? You don't hit guys on the top of the head with your elbow, things like this. This school, when you go to fight. Practice. This is how you're fighting. I mean, I don't know how they could do it. I mean, they're military guys. They're tough, right? But most karate schools are not like this. Um, you would do these moves, but you would not actually hit the guy or kick him full strength or hit him full strength. Yes. I know karate has a ranking system. What level are they? Because they're to me, they're showing a level of like flexibility and being able to use that flexibility in their sparring and combat that is well above anything I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, this is a demo. So this guy's the master, so he's probably, you know, sixth or seventh on. He's pretty high up. Fifth on is, is basically like, fourth or fifth on is like, you know, you're, you're qualified to teach and own your own, run your own school. And seventh on is like you're really a master of this art, right? So these guys, this guy, main guy's good. But the other guy could be a, he could be a second, third, fourth on guy, depending on how good he is, you know. Um, oh yeah, these are all black belt guys. You know, and obviously, if you're learning the art, you're going you're gonna to start out with a lot simpler techniques. For instance, all the things he's doing here, you, know, you might just practice those sweeps just on, your, on those for a, you know, a year, just to get the sweeps down. And then once you got those down, then you combine it with something else. You, know, you, you wouldn't do something this complicated all at once. You would learn a lot of basic things first and then chain them together and do this later on. And that's true for most martial arts schools, and certainly for karate. Now, you want to go and study this stuff, you want a tough school like that, but you don't want to go to Japan and join the military? Well, all you got to do is go down to Glendale, Pasadena, and you can study with this guy, Tak Kubota. And Kubota is the closest thing that we have here in this country to like killer karate. He is one tough mofo. He is my grand teacher because he was my teacher, Otake Sensei's teacher for 25 years. Otake Sensei taught under him. Um, he is really tough. 
And supposedly the rumor is that he's killed two of his students accidentally. <laughs> supposedly. Um, uh, he, his, a lot of the guys in his school are big, tough guys. They go kind of full tilt. Uh, one of the reasons my teacher developed his style, his own style, was because he was fighting all these sort of killer karate guys. And my teacher's, you know, five foot three, you know, 100 pounds, soaking wet, and he had to fight all these guys. And so he developed a style that was good at defending himself from these guys. Um, but you can see a little bit of Kubota. Let me see if I can show you a little bit of just how his, his training would go. So look at his knuckles, by the way. given only to the creator of an entire style of martial arts accepted and practiced worldwide. He holds the highest rank possible in Japanese karate. Tenth Don Soke Takayuki Kubota, born on the island of Kyushu, Japan in 1934 and raised in martial arts. The arts of warfare. Kill your enemy or he will kill you. His entire body was hardened by the Makawara by a sledgehammer, by soaking in brine and jabbing his extended fingers and hands into a bucket of sand. And while still pre-teen, he would go to the local slaughterhouses and kill hogs with fist shots to the head. More than just a phenomenal genius of the martial arts himself, the teaching techniques and open spirit of Soke Takayuki Kubota has accounted for more world champions and masters than possibly any other grandmaster in history. And he still teaches public classes. Still turns out crop after crop of outstanding karateka and outstanding citizens. But if you want to go study in Glendale, you can go study with this guy and they are a killer karate school and you will be, if you can hang in there, you know, nobody in the street is going to scare you as much as going to class. So, <laughs> is that a good thing? <laughs> good thing, yeah, it could be a good thing. So there's lots of offshoots of Shotokan. Okay, Kubota's one of them. There's other offshoots of Shotokan. All these styles have like offshoots. Okay, so just be clear about that because it's very complicated. Other styles. This is the this is the Nahate lineage, and again, uh, this lineage is mostly championed by this family, uh, the Higoana family. The Higoana family are still teaching uh, this style. And again, the guy in Thousand Oaks, uh, his teacher is a Higoana. So they're still around. This is Morio Higoana. He's the current guy, and he's still around. And so, again, this style is very, very, uh, in one way, pure. It still can trace its origins way, right back to the original guy. And um, so you can see these, these guys here. Uh, and again, this style now is called Gojo-ru, which means hard, soft style. And they're still around. This is, the, this is the original style of martial art that I started when I was a kid. I did this art when I was 16. And I studied probably with somebody who had studied with Eagle on it. Right, because there's peace going around. Oh, by the way, you'll notice all these Miyagi guys here. Miyagi here, Miyagi here. Miyagi, uh, these Miyagis become the, uh, the influence, the inspiration for uh, the Miyagi in the Karate Kid. And the Miyagi in the Karate Kid is doing Nahate style. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. This, this is this is this is Nahate style. It's very circular, right? Very very circular. Against the Cobra Kai, who are Shurite, Tamarite, you know, fast linear style, right? And you know, but you know, the soft hard style of, of you know Miyagi. This is this is Nahate style, right? By the way, Nahate style. Here is Morio Higoana. 
here. And here's some guy from China doing white southern white crane. Well, you know, guess what? This looks really similar. In fact, so similar that they can do their kata together and almost that the movements are almost still the same. So this is very cool. So if you want to study southern white crane kung fu, probably the best way you can do this is go down and find a Gojiru karate school and study with the Gojiru guys. I like the style. These guys are also very, very tough. They do like intense conditioning. One is you'll sit and you'll, you'll hold the style here like this and somebody will come, you know, and they will, they will basically take a two by four and whack you with it, you know, strengthen you up. They have all sorts of strengthening exercises, all these crazy things that they do. Um, I talked to the guy here about studying with him. I said, yeah, I can't do that crazy stuff. I'm too old. He goes, he goes that's okay. You know, for older people, we emphasize the Jew. And the Jew means, uh, the Japanese character means soft. And it's the same character as you find in jujitsu. You know, soft art, right? Soft art. You know? So when you get older, you can do more of the soft stuff. But when you're younger, you hit each other with boards and hit the makawari, you condition yourself, all those kind of things are traditional. And again, here you got a Chinese practitioner, and here you got Morigo Higana doing Gojiru, very similar. Now, <coughs> where do we get this word karate? Karate. So we had te is the original Okinawan word for hand. Kara, really originally, the character for kara means China, Chinese. And there's a character for kara in Chinese. So this was called Chinese hand, Chinese hand way, the way of a Chinese hand. Okay. But what happens is karate comes to Japan around the turn of the century. The Japanese are becoming very, very nationalistic at this time. And nationalism is really on the rise and is infecting the government and infecting the military especially. Hopefully this isn't reminding you of anything maybe going on currently. Yet Japan's becoming very nationalistic. So Japanese leaders are saying, I'm a nationalist. Just to give you pause to think. Okay. And what happens is Japan, uh, in this nationalistic fervor, decides that they are going to basically be the strong man of Asia, and other weaker places uh, that have resources, natural resources, are going to come under their subjugation. And so what they do is they invade China. And we can't have our now Japanese uh, martial art that's now being taught in high schools and is being taught in the military. And again, it gets taught in schools. It basically is a way to prepare people for the military. And so karate takes on a sort of paramilitary flavor to it. So when you go to a karate studio and everybody lines up by rank and everybody bows and everybody, you know, does, oh, you know, all this stuff, this is all stuff that did not come from Okinawa. This came from, you know, nationalistic era Japan military, okay? All this stuff and saying us to each other, right? Us is a military acknowledgement. And now, you know, you'll see all these karate guys that meet each other, they go, us, you know, we all do this in karate. We all say, oh, see each other. That comes from Japanese military in that nationalistic era in the early 1900s. It's not, it's nothing to do with karate. So when you're lining up in karate class and you're all by belts and you're all doing this formal stuff, you're essentially not practicing karate at that point. You're practicing being in the ma Japanese military circa 1930. Okay? So it's very important to know about that. Okay? We, that's all forgotten now. Most karate practitioners don't know that history. Okay. You don't know about this nationalist history. So if you're a Japanese nationalist and you're practicing karate and you're going out with your military pretty soon to subjugate China, the weak man of Asia as it's been called, you do not want the martial art you practice to be called Chinese hand, Chinese fist, way of the Chinese hand because that implies weakness. And so what you do is you find another character that sounds like China but is a different character. And so they substitute the China character with this character for empty, empty hand. He's kara being empty. And you know kara meaning empty. You guys all know this because this is the same character that comes in another Japanese word that you may have heard. A Japanese word that kind of comes from the English. And some of you may have practiced this fine art of karaoke. Karaoke, right? Karaoke, okay? What does karaoke mean? Empty orchestra. Right? Empty orchestra. Right? Karaoke. Right? Okay? Kara. Empty hand. So they substitute this. 
Now it's the empty hand way, and no, no, no connection to those weak, weakling Chinese who are going to go over there and subjugate and subjugate all sorts of like incredible genocidal abuses and things like this and fight this huge war over there. And, um, okay. What happens when you, when, you, when you have your leaders expounding nationalism, right? It's a very dangerous sign. Just saying, I'm not being political here, I'm just saying, that's a real warning sign. Okay? Got Japan into a whole hell of a lot of trouble. Basically caused their entire nation to be destroyed and bombed with atomic bombs twice, overrun, and put under the, under the control of the United States until they could rebuild and get their act together. So again, you know, that's, that's where nationalism got them. That's what nationalism got them. Not a good thing. So here's the original uh, uh, character. And, and this character is, means China, but it means China of the Tang Dynasty. So it really means Tang, Kara. It's the Tang China, Tang Dynasty. Of course, Tang Dynasty has a huge influence on Japan. Okay? And then it gets changed to this. And you'll still find karate practitioners who say, oh, no, 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 it's always empty hand. Okay? All right, that's my brief talk about Japanese karate. Yes? So, is there a difference in pronunciation of... Not as far as I know. I think it's pronounced pretty much the same. But it's just the symbol, not China. China's weak. Anything to do with that. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention another uh, offshoot of karate that's not, um, not entirely from Japan. Um, and this is the karate that comes um, really either from Japan to America or Japan and or Okinawa and or China to the Hawaiian Islands. And this is a kind of karate that's called Kimpo Karate. There is a, a, a school of Kimpo Karate that comes directly from Japan. And they were supposedly Shorinru or Shorinjiru, and they were basically some Shaolin monks came to Japan and settled in Japan and started teaching martial arts. And the school grew up around that. This school does not come from Okinawa. It's directly from the Shaolin Temple. And then that school went to Hawaii and also came to the United States and still is around. You can find those guys around. Um, there are other schools where uh, stuff came from Okinawa, went to, with the Japanese to Hawaii, because of course, you know, the Japanese were brought to Hawaii like they were brought here as farm workers. And so they brought their traditional culture with them, and that included uh, some karate practitioners. And then also you have in China people who were Chinese, who brought over traditional Chinese kung fu. And in the melting pot of Hawaii, some of these things melted together and turned into these so-called so Kinpo or Kinpo schools. And so you'll find variations of this. So, you know, and there's lots of these. And I'm not going to go into detail about all of them, but here you have Kinpo Karate. Uh, and this is a school, you can go down to Camrio, uh, downtown Camrio, there's a Kinpo Karate school. There is Shaolin Kinpo Chuan Fa. Okay, Kinpo means fist, Chuan means fist. So this is Shaolin Fist Kinpo. So it's Japanese and Chinese. Um, and again, there's White Tiger School, there's this Butsusiri Ru, Kimpo Jutsu, you know, all sorts of different variations of this kind of Kimpo thing. And this is very confusing to people to know where Kimpo comes from. Um, Kimpo School had a number of founders from Hawaii. Uh, one of the main ones with this guy, Matose, who's a very colorful, interesting character. And I don't have time to go into details about him, but very interesting guy. Um, I think he ended up in prison. Um, one of these guys did. And then you have another guy, Chow. He was a Chinese practitioner, but then also brought in and you know, started teaching you know, karate guys in Hawaii. And of course, the most famous of them, as far as we are concerned in the modern world, oops, is this guy, uh, is this guy, Ed Parker. Ed Parker was a progenitor of a number of uh, very famous martial artists in America uh, and, uh, and also a lot of not so famous people. Uh, he really had a huge influence. He was a Caucasian guy who grew up in Hawaii. Um, I think he was Mormon. There's a lot of Mormons in Hawaii. 
and um, started studying uh, karate. Um, and but originally his karate was very kind of Okinawan, and then over the years he included a lot more Chinese stuff into it. He mixed in a lot more Chinese circular kinds of things into it. Um, I have an interesting relationship with Ed Parker very indirectly because two of my main teachers, actually three of my main teachers, were students of Ed Parker, direct students of Ed Parker. My teacher Ted Russo <coughs> in Santa Cruz and Linda Dorigo in Santa Cruz were direct students of Ed Parker, got their black belts directly from Ed Parker. And then my current teacher, Otake Sensei, was one of Ed Parker's first American students on the mainland, when Ed Parker came to the mainland. And uh, Otake Sensei was one of the first student that, uh, to get a brown belt from Ed Parker. He got this brown belt from Ed Parker, and then he decided to go his own way and study more traditional karate um, later in his career. But he's one of Ed Parker's first students. Um, Ed Parker was very influential. Um, he, he hung out with people like Bruce Lee, he hung out with people like, like uh, Chuck Norris and uh, Joe Lewis and all these kind of people. It had a lot to do with training and bringing karate and popularizing karate in the United States. He was Elvis's teacher of karate. Elvis did some karate, at least until he got too fat to do it anymore. Um, and so he, he, he taught very famous people. So very, very influential. Um, started a number of his own schools, developed a lot of his own style of karate, a lot of his own way of doing things. Becomes, over time, much more circular, much more kung fu-like later on in his career. He was very known for being very fast and very circular. His nickname was the Spinning Death because he'd like to do a lot of spinning techniques, which, by the way, I don't highly recommend. Uh, but he could pull them off because he was very fast with these things. Um, and so there's a lot about Ed Parker. Again, we're not going to run out of time, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about him, um, except to say that um, there he is with Elvis. And here he is in Glendale, one of the first schools. This is him here, one of his first schools. And um, you can't see too well in this picture. Uh, here is my teacher, Ted, from Santa Cruz. And Ted was an early student of Ed Parker's. Ted left uh, studying Ed to go and, and decided he was going to study traditional kung fu and decided, hey, I'm going to go all the way and do Chinese stuff. And so he's an you know, excellent, excellent martial artist. He was my teacher for almost 10 years. And this is Parker here. And here he is with a young, still teenage, I believe, uh, ben Otaki. So this is Ben here. This is my current teacher. And um, here's Ben Parker. We, we found these photos and we showed these to him. He's like, ah, oh, he thought that was a kick. He hadn't seen these pictures in years and years and years. And again, Ben Otaki goes off and studies on his own, uh, studies traditional uh, Shotokan, and then he comes back to Glendale and he studies with Kubota, and then he goes off on his own. And this is Ben. Here. And again, if you want to try Ben's variation of karate, which is Shin Shin Megindo, this style also very, very circular that we do. I don't know if the circularity of Ben's style was influenced by Parker or not. I think maybe. I don't think Ben would admit to that, but I think maybe. Um, and uh, anyway, so we practice Saturday mornings. We do an offshoot of Shotokan, perhaps with some flavor of Kimpo, I don't know, I would never say that in front of Ben. Um, but basically, a style of karate that works against fighting killer karate people from Kubota school. Okay. And we're there Saturday mornings, anybody wants to come try it out, you're welcome to come try it out. All right, so some karate terms, and there's lots of karate terms uh, in karate. Uh, you, can, you can read through these. Uh, the important ones, uh, Budo, we should have talked about this, this means the way of martial arts. Bunkai mean your applications of techniques. Don is black belt rank. Do is way your path. Dojo is the place you train, the place of the way. A lot of Japanese sayings that we use in karate, we say domo arigato gozaimashita, which means thank you very much. Somebody hits you and you go domo arigato, thank you for the lesson. Um, uh, and then again, a lot of times the use the uniform, we say hi, yes, we say hajime, begin, we say kumite for sparring. Kame means uh, sparring posture. Karateka means karate student. Kata is a form, these movements. Ki is like chi. This is like I talked to you about in Taoism, like chi. The Japanese translation is ki, and it means mind, spirit, or energy. 
ki is a focusing shout. There's a lot of karate schools that like to yell a lot. Uh, and then, you know, lots of different things. Kumite, sparring again here. Q is uh, below uh, black belt ranks. The makawara is a punching board. Mate means weight. Onigashi, onigashimas, onigashimas. Come into the dojo. Onigashimas, please teach me. Okay, if you're not in a military type school, you might say onigashimas. If you're in a traditional Japanese school that was really doing this pre-1930, you will come into school and say onigashimas. Otherwise, you'll say os, os, which is spelled osu. means os, greeting, affirmation. It's very military. Um, and then you have Senpai as the senior student, Sensei as the instructor, Shihan as the master originator of the style, or, or Soke also, uh, Waza as technique, Yami means stop, Yoi means ready, go. Yoi, I'm ready, okay? So this is a kind of technique. Lots of different techniques in karate, basic techniques, darn it. Uh, basic techniques in karate, uh, these are stances. And so uh, you'll see these different kind of stances. You'll learn these things. You'll do a lot of this, uh, this kind of stancing, standing around, strengthening yourself, all these different kind of things here. Front stance, back stance, cat stance. Notice the word cat is neko. Neko shi dachi. Neko shi dachi. Uh, you know neko because it's maneki neko, hello kitty, right? So. And this is front stance, etc., etc. There's a lot of stances. You'll practice all these kind of things. Techniques, um, hand techniques, uh, ude koke, uh, wrist, impi, el elbows, saikin, knuckle, yurikin, other part of the knuckle, uh, haishu, back fist, nukite, finger strike, etc., etc., etc. On here, uh, iponkin, so your front finger, first finger, uh, shuto. This is the chop, and haito, chop this way. So all these things, a crane hand keiko, okay. and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll learn all these. Uh, punches, punches suke. So again, uh, you'll see all these different sukis. Oizuki, front punch. Uh, uh, what's the other one? Oizuki and... Um, uh, uh, let's see the Yamazuki, these two plan punches, uh, uh, Yakazuki, that uh, rear punch. Uh, again, all the punches you think about, here they're all here, you know, these different names for them. Kicks, uh, kick is Gary. So my Gary front kick, Yoka Gary side kick, uh, two kinds of sidekicks, Ushiri Gary, sidekick, and Mawashi Gary, roundhouse kick. Those are the main ones, and then you've got a bunch of different other ones as well. Okay. Uh, kata, I talked to you about kata already. And this is people doing kata together. I'll give you a little taste of this. Again, this is.
about that. And you learn, probably for black belt level, you learn about 15 of these, and they become more complicated as you get higher up. Uh, techniques. Uh, these are called bunkai. So, for instance, our school of karate is really heavy on bunkai. We like to practice techniques rather than kata. And you'll notice that's also kind of a philosophy of Jeet Kune Do. Um, you know, they, they practice, they don't practice really much of any kata, they mostly just do techniques. Our school is the same way. And that also may be because Ben was around in that time when Bruce Lee was around. Ben knows Danny Nisanto, he knows those, that group of people. And maybe he was influenced by them, I don't know, he's never told me that or not. But he likes techniques, he thinks it's realistic. If you want to fight, you practice the techniques, you don't practice the kata. Mm -hmm. And the techniques, there's lots of various ones um, uh, you can do. Uh, but you basically, these are, you have to do this with another person. You don't do these in the air on your own, you do these with another person. And so that makes them much more realistic. And lots of different techniques in karate. And also weapons. And again, the weapons in karate derive from Okinawa, unless the school has been heavily influenced by Japanese weapons. So if your school has some connection with Japan and there was somebody who came in your school from Japan way back in the day and taught you Japanese weapons, then you might do Japanese weapons. The traditional Okinawan weapons are the traditional weapons of karate, and these are all derived from, from uh, 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 farm implements. So the bow is a staff, and that may be some kind of cudgel. The saw is a metal fork. Uh, the taiko is a horseshoe. The nunchucks, you guys know nunchucks, these were horse bridles. So they would go in the horse's mouth and use these to control the horse, and they get turned into a weapon. Uh, eku is the oar, boat oar. The tonfa was a, which is a stick with, uh, this is the tonfa here. This is a uh, thing that was uh, for a grinder, a handle for a grinder. Okay. Uh, the sickle here, this is for chopping down rice. Uh, shield and sport, short spear, well this is actually a weapon, but you know, you would have hidden this. And then a weighted chain, this would have been used for other things. So these are all the traditional Okinawan weapons. Okay. Somewhat hidden. And by the way, this is John Sells, and John Sells has come and demonstrated for us before he's now retired and moved away. Uh, one of the finest martial artists I've ever met in my life. Unbelievable knowledge about the stuff, and I was part of a weapons demonstration he did. My job was, as Uke, as, as the person you practiced with, was to stand there. And I stood there, and he was swinging the weapons around, and they came literally like this close to my face. And he was generating so much power with them. I could just feel it going next to me across me, and just like, uh... And he, I mean, about this close, and it didn't hit me. Um, unbelievable guy. And again, he's the guy who wrote the book on karate. And so he's, he's the weapons guy. Sometimes does seminars on weapons, but I think he moved away now, so he's not around much anymore. And then this is his book, Unante, which I highly recommend um, if you're interested in karate. So, questions. That's my brief sort of survey, very surface level survey of karate. Any questions on anything? Yes? Sometimes this is just a back fist. This is just a technique. Oh, okay. So usually karate, they like to they like to they like to hit here. The fist is it's palm up, and they come out, and then at the end of the end of the strike, and it's it's relatively loose. And it comes out at the end of the strike. It turns over, and as it turns over and hits, it tenses, and then relaxes. And so the tension is only right at the end, right? Of course, a lot of people practice very tense. That's incorrect. Okay. That's the so this is the typical karate punch. As we're in Kung Fu, they like to punch a lot like this. Just sort of like they don't, or they might go half turned over. They don't, karate they like the full turnover. Right? And you get this one punch, one kill mentality because this is, gets you the maximum power by turning over, right? As where you're just punching a guy, punching him, punching him, punching him, get him off balance, and then like finish him off. So other styles don't use that, that turning over fist as much. But karate, that's common. But they have back fists. They have, you know, uh, uh, chops, strikes, they have roundhouse punches, they've got everything that, you know, all the other systems have. They just like to emphasize this one because they're this idea of one punch, one kill. You know, you get a lot of power over that. Other questions about karate? Yes? Uh, I just wanted to clarify something. Uh, so the, uh, the shorten 
the Shonen Ryu was uh, more of the uh, or more influenced by the Southern Shaolin styles or the Northern. There is some, my speculation is that there was some influence from Northern Shaolin, but there's no real proof of that. But it looks a lot like Northern Shaolin styles, but there's no proof of that. So we can say definitively we know that, that, that all the styles were in, in, of, of karate were influenced by Southern Shaolin. We know that. That's documented. But the Northern influence we don't know as much about. And it may have been just something that's local to Okinawa, these guys they're fighting in planes, they're fighting in the other places that need to be linear and quick, as opposed to the guys near the ocean who can be more circular and fighting on boats and stuff. Who knows? We don't really know. Okay? We do know that the Southern Shallon connection is documented, the Northern one is not. But it's my speculation about that. Okay? Good question. Yes? So in the comic demonstration, uh, is the noise from the movement tricky or are they say that again? Uh, the, is the noise from the movements the gi or the breathing? Say it again. I didn't quite hear you. The gi. So you, so you hear the noise in the car. Yes. A lot of the, the, the gi's are, especially if you would give up the gi and start, you, you'll hear a movement from the gi. Okay. Like it'll, it'll, it'll actually rustle because you really, as you punch, you're going straight, you're rubbing on your body. Okay. And so you'll hear that snap that comes from the gi. Okay. okay that's not sound effects. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Actually. I didn't know whether or not it was the breathing or the. Yeah, the bre he was also breathing too. He's also a, he's doing some breathing, controlled breathing as he's doing that. Okay. And some of the kata have controlled breathing. Some people do it that way. Some people do not. It just depends on the style and the school of your teacher. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Well, yes. And some of the karate I've watched, they do. I can't remember what it is, but they make a noise. Yeah. They yell. Yeah. Yeah, that's just to focus your power. Okay. Maybe your opponent's scared, you know, get them off balance because you're screaming. Chinese don't like to yell so much. They stomp instead of like that, and then they hit you, right? Okay. They, the Chinese like to stomp, and that focuses the power, too. Japanese like to yell. Mm -hmm. they, they do it. So Kiai, you'll find also in other martial arts, like a lot of this, a lot of the sword guys, Kiai, I think that's ridiculous because the sword doesn't care. You don't need power for the sword. I'll find <laughs> that. Uh, those of the sword guys like the Kiai, you know, but you, know, you get the guy off balance by yelling at him. You know, focus your energy. That's what it's for. Okay. Um, again, some karate schools emphasize that more than others. And again, Kiai, usually you'll hear it during the, um, during the kata. Yeah. Points in the kata where they're traditionally where you would Kiai. And they're very specific. Yeah. Sometimes people, when they're fighting, will key eye during the fight, like sparring. Some schools do that more than others. 